So about a week ago, Radio Free Mormon, or RFM, on his podcast, decided to do a review of part one and part two of Who Killed Joseph Smith. And so I went on and watched that, and halfway in the middle of that started making comments, and they asked if I would come in afterwards and call in, and then we could discuss it, and we did all of that. And in that portion, RFM revealed what he believes is his theory of who killed Joseph Smith. So, of course, I had to test that and think about that and come on today and talk about it. So that's what this episode's going to be about today. And so I have watched both movies and I've looked at them closely. And the reason for this is because there are a lot of people who have been contacting me and wanting to know what I think about this and what's my take on it. And there have been so many people who have done this that finally I said, well, I, I guess we need to do a show about it. So I've looked at everything. I know you have as well. Wanted to introduce Steve Briner and Peter Brown. We were on the show today, and Steve was actually in both movies and helped me tremendously to finish part two. And Peter Brown, you've probably seen him a lot online, and he actually has had experience with RFM, and so and has some great insights. So I not thought RFM, I'm, not RFM. Who were you with that you helped? Um, I used to write for John DeLynn in two thousand and eight. Okay. So, but you've followed RFM for many years. Yeah, correct? for the past two or three years. With him. And yeah. RFM has a pretty big audience. And uh, anyway, so I was excited that he talked about the movies. So, Steve, what, what did you think? What was your thoughts about the show overall? Okay. I thought they were, I thought they were respectful. I thought that they, they did put thought into it. They weren't there to just slam you and slam your theory and say it didn't hold any water at all. Um, they, one thing I noticed that they did is they concentrated so much on the expert portion. Right. Um, when, I mean, in reality, the show, the whole movie, who killed Joseph Smith too, it's not really about who killed Joseph Smith. I felt like they, they concentrated so much on that one portion that they really, they missed the whole point of the entire movie, which was what, which was go on a spiritual journey and don't trust any man, right. but go on a spiritual journey for yourself and find God. Yeah, that's interesting. You should say that because that was a big part of the movie. But the only people who really understood that are the ones who are also on that spiritual journey yeah. themselves. So great, Peter. What do you think overall? Well, um, so Mormonism Live is probably one of the more exciting and most fair kind of podcast of its type. And so I was really happy that they were fairly respectful. Um, I felt that Bill Real was probably a little more respectful to you than RFM in this, uh, at least the parts that I'd, I'd listened to. Right. But um, it really came clear to me that they were trying to focus on a legal aspect of this case. Right. And that they were playing to an audience that was... Uh, and maybe we'll get to this, I don't know, um, down the road, but, um, uh, their audience in my understanding is going to be, uh, not a fan of your theory. Right. And so they're kind of playing to that audience that they have. And so he was going to focus really squarely on the legal aspect of this as if you were trying to convict Willard Richards and John Taylor of murdering Joseph Smith. And if that is the bar that we're going to set, we all know that it can't be done or with the evidence that we have today. Well, that leads me into my next question. RFM says it does not matter to him who killed Joseph Smith. He has no dog in this fight. Did you believe him when he said that? No, I didn't. Because these, uh, the, the, uh, the ex-Mormon crowd is, has this idea that Joseph Smith and Brigham Young are aligned and that Joseph's ideas are Brigham's ideas. And for what, for whatever it's worth, they have years and years and years of tying these two at the hip. And so they would have to make new arguments and try to, to make more complicated arguments that show the harms of Mormonism 
if they were to separate those two. And I think right. that's what's really challenging for them is they want to see that Willard Richards and John Taylor were friends to Joseph Smith right. because they carried his legacy on right. and took his beliefs to the next level. Steve, just from this episode watching it, did you feel like he was being honest when he said he didn't care about the outcome? So... I didn't feel like he was being honest because he does. He said he doesn't have a dog in the fight, but he does. He absolutely does. And I mean, so this whole kind of, and I know we'll get into this in a minute, but this whole kind of ex Mormon crowd that they are kind of a part of their, their narrative is that everything is false. Like Joseph Smith right. wasn't a true prophet. The book of Mormon's false. A lot of them, I don't know. I can't speak for those two, but I know a lot of them are atheist or agnostic yeah. And so their whole everything, I mean, they say that everything's a lie except for this one thing. Right. So they agree with the church. The church is lying about everything except for this one thing. Joseph was a polygamist. So let's get into that because I don't think a lot of people understand the difference between these three categories. We have the TBMs. That stands for True Blue Mormon. Or True Believing Mormon. Or True, true Believing, believing Mormon, Mormon, which is somebody who is fully loyal to the LDS Church. Nelson is the prophet. Everything he says is true. Then you have the Exmos, which are, no, the church is not true. It's never been true, not since Joseph's time. And then you have this group called the Remnant. And the Remnant all three of these groups, what they have in common is they all have been baptized LDS. They were all raised. They all were converted. At some point, they knew everything about the LDS church. And then their beliefs, the remnant and the Exmo beliefs changed. The ex-Mormons generally threw everything about the church out. Where's the Nevermos, Justin? <sighs> the Nevermos. Th they're that's in outer because darkness. They way, Delin always says <laughs> that's the biggest part of his audience is the people who have never been Mormons but are just fascinated by this Like mess. Steve Pinacker. He's a never Mormon. That's right. Which, yeah, he's a super fun guy. I'm, I'll create another <laughs> circle for Steve. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, so the and the remnant group, I want to explain very clearly again, is people that do believe Joseph Smith was a prophet, the Book of Mormon is true, but after Joseph died, most of everything else after that, they don't they don't fall. They don't think Brigham was a prophet or any prophet after. Let him. me make a comment on that. There are so right now today there are seventy different religions that all use the Book of Mormon. Every single one of them used the Book of Mormon, and they all you know it came from Joseph Smith, but every one of them teach different doctrine. Right. Okay, so they can't all be true. In talking with all those people, every single one of those people have a guy. They have their prophet, the Strangites right. and the Whiteites and the Rigdonites and the RL. They all have this guy that they believe right. in, but they all teach different things. But they all believe the Book of Mormon is true. Right. So this chart is just for LDS, yeah. meaning the Brighamite line. Yeah. But you're right. If me, you did the full whoever <laughs> believes in the Book of Mormon, Joseph Smith. Let me jump in and add a little bit on that, too, because I think one of the things that we probably want to add on that is that Joseph Smith is true. Yes. Book of Mormon is true. Yes. But most people that are of a remnant mindset, they're anti-hierarchy. Right. Yeah. And so they may have a guru or a leader or somebody who teaches things, but for the most part, it's between you and the Lord It's between you and God. They're, they're kind of walking away from, um, you know, Brigham hierarchy, right. even Joseph hierarchy to some extent. And they're trying to get back more to, um, a proto Christian concept where you're just directly with Jesus Christ. With Jesus. That's right. That's a good way to describe this remnant group. And that word remnant comes from the scriptures. And maybe some people in the remnant group would say, yeah, I'm remnant, or maybe they wouldn't. Nobody has a t one term that everyone would say that describes us, but we're just going to use that as the working title for now. And there's crossover between the three groups. So yes, the remnant still believes Joseph is a true prophet and the Book of Mormon is true, just like the TBMs. But we do not believe the LDS church is true, just like the Exmos. And the Exmos agree with the TBMs that Joseph practiced polygamy. So 
in between those crossovers, let me ask you to nail this down a little bit more clearly, some of the beliefs of each of the different groups. Steve, I'll start with you. What does each of these groups believe about God and Jesus Christ? Okay, TBM, I think absolutely God and Jesus Christ, they believe in it. Remnant, God and Jesus Christ. Exmo, now that is very varied. Right. A lot of those people that I've spoken with, they're atheist or agnostic, um, but some of them do believe in a higher power. Right. I would, I would say that. Would you agree with that? Peter? Yeah, I, I will put their, um, Sandra Tanner was probably in that Exmo group, but she's a Christian. So she's come out of Mormonism, but she right. still believes in Jesus Christ. Sean Craney is an example of that as well. But I right. think that they're a smaller subset of that group. That's not the overwhelming right. majority of that group. The overwhelming, the overwhelming majority of them have thrown everything out. Right. God and Jesus. Um, I will say that because I, I have studied with them, I have friends that are this way, yeah. that uh, most of them are politically aligned to progressivism. Right. They trust the government. They trust experts. Um, there are a few that are libertarian in their beliefs, but for the, for by, by and large, I would say they, they've glummed on to sort of the ideals espoused by like Klaus Schwab and, Interesting. and, um, you know, sort of right. a utopian idea of big government and the state sort of like fixing all the historical wrongs and social right. justice. And, right. and that almost informs their religious beliefs more than anything else. So what do they, what is the Exmos? How do they feel about scripture? Well, they would think that it's just myth. Okay. So you know, essentially like completely made up Joseph Smith or made it useful up. at all. Well, or? even back to the Bible times, they would look at it as these are people who are trying to explain the natural world. Maybe they're having um, hallucinogenic experiences. Yeah. They're trying to describe what happened when a volcano blew up. And so they're going to ascribe it to God. They're going to write down scripture. Got it. And, and that's how we got scriptures today. Steve, how does the remnant feel about scripture? Standard works, Bible, Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants. So okay, I think price. that it all has to be scrutinized. The remnant believes that it all has to be scrutinized. Um, not so much the Book of Mormon, but definitely the DNC, uh, Pearl of Great Price, to some extent, Bible has to right. be scrutinized. I mean, the remnant believes what the Book of Mormon says in that the great and abominable church took things out. So this Change is a things. little bit, might seem like an easy question, but what do the TBMs think about scripture? Whatever <laughs> their current yeah. leaders say that it is, whether it's, it's, what the yeah, it's, it's the it come to, it's the come follow me manual and what, however scripture the aligns right with handbook, that. The handbook, the handbook, the handbook is scripture. Conference yeah. talks, all of So it. that it's trumps scripture. it, you know, so, you know, I, I would think that remnant, I will say this. I don't think remnant people, believe everything literally in scripture, yeah. but they take everything seriously. Right. And, and mostly literally, but they leave room open somewhat to like the article of faith where we believe the Bible to be, you know, the word of God, as long as, long as, as it's translated, translated correctly. Right. So I don't think remnant is so they're not biblio idolatrous. Like right. a lot of Christians are where every, mm. you know, every word that, in the King James version as God's word. But. By the way, we're, is it fair to say we're all in the remnant as far as these three circles? Yes. Okay. So yes, that's our bias. <laughs> when you hear our explanations, we're going to be a little extra positive about the remnant. That's the way <laughs> but we we've also it. spent our time in the blue circle. That's right. Um, and to some extent, in and the to some extent, the red circle. Yeah. And where is our FM? X, X, it is solidly in the XMO circle, yeah. which is why we're going through this. Some more questions. Um, Peter, really quickly, how do the three groups feel about Joseph Smith? So I think the remnant is probably the group that has the strongest feelings about Joseph Smith because they've done their homework on him. They've read his public teachings. Uh, they know about his uh, crusades in Nauvoo going out and teaching against polygamy. They see where things that he taught didn't align with those that followed him and went West. And so I think they're going to have a very strong feeling about Joseph Smith. Right. TBMs do too, 
but only within the context of Utah Mormonism. So there's a lot of Joseph Smith in Utah Mormonism that's the product of the narrative of Brigham Young, Willard Richards, William Clayton, right. Orson Pratt, Party P. Pratt. Right. They had they had 50 years essentially of sort of remaking the man in their own image when they started to sort of solidify their theology. So by the time 1877 rolls around and they've printed the standard works with the 132 included, uh, Joseph Smith is somebody very different than he was in 1844. They, so they, if, kind, of, they oh. kind of put him on a pedestal, the TBMs, yeah. but then they put him on that pedestal, but then they tear him down. So if President Nelson and Joseph Smith <laughs> said something that contradicted each other, who trumps it? President Nelson. President Nelson. All the way, right? Yeah. yeah. Now here's a harder question. If Brigham Young and Joseph Smith said something that contradicts, who trumps it? In their mind. Oh, geez. I think Brigham Young. <laughs> I think Brigham Young. Yeah. I mean, and I'll tell you why. Because when I read yeah. I read the recently released Saints um, um, histories, and, you know, Joseph Smith, it's very messy in the history when you read Saints Volume 1. They have to deal with polygamy. They have to deal with right. the, Missouri, uh, the Missouri challenges and the Kirtland Safety Society and all the things that Joseph Smith gets smeared with. But once you get to Utah, it's like Brigham Young is seen as this person that finally was able to like figure it out, get it all put yeah. together. And they have this sort of like Lord of the Rings send off where he dies at the end of his life. And he's heading off into the sunset going, Joseph, Joseph. Uh, I've heard that. And, yeah, and died uh, saying Joseph, yeah. calling out his name. And, and yeah. you get this, it, it really paints him as sort of the implementer of Joseph's messy vision and he's able to figure it out and yeah. get it all worked out perfectly. And when you dig into the Utah history, which is really tough to do because of it, 20 years, it was sitting in isolation right. and, and was able to be curated by uh, those that lived out here. Uh, you get some very challenging and very ugly stories that most of us have never heard about. Just to cement that point, do the TBMs like Brigham Young or Emma Smith better? Brigham Young. Oh, Brigham Young. Yeah, for not sure. Not even close. Yeah. They throw Emma under the bus. Emma's a Any fallen woman. Get, she's, right? she's not an well, elect Because woman. of what Brigham said. Yeah. Or she or, or she has PTSD, so we can yeah. forgive her. Right. Yeah. Okay, Steve, really quickly. Difference between the three on um, personal revelation. Okay, I'd say the Exmos believe, do not believe in personal revelation. They believe in the experts, in going to a man, right. the expert, to find that out. TBM, I think that they do believe in revelation, but as long as it doesn't contradict with any leader, if it contradicts with your bishop's revelation, yeah, they or believe your, that the leaders yeah. can get revelation. Stay in yeah. your lane. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. And especially if it contradicts what the prophet said, then what do remnants think about remnants personal revelation? think it's all that's, that's the only thing it's is personal revelation, deal, right? Yeah. That's you have religious, you have religious freedom to go to God and get an answer for yourself. And if you and I disagree, then we hash it out and try to convince one another lovingly and kindly until we come to a unity of the faith. Great. Last but not least, here's the big one. Polygamy. <laughs> what are the three groups think about well, polygamy? Started I wanted here. to jump in because we didn't really capture what the Exmos felt about Joseph Smith. And okay. I think that's an important element of this Great. is for a lot of people. I think there are people that are genuine in seeing the harms that Mormonism has caused. And maybe it's been in their lives or their families' lives. And they see that the easiest way to overcome people wanting to believe in Mormonism is to go after Joseph Smith. Right. So all they have to do is say, read the CES letter, read about Helen Mark Kimball, Joseph Smith is a pedophile, and the whole thing unravels. It means the Book of Mormon's not true. It means that um, Jesus Christ isn't true, that God doesn't exist, because they use the same sort of like argument, argument techniques against Mormonism. They then translate that into Christianity, into all sorts of theology, right. and they back up to sort of an atheist agnostic belief standpoint. So why do the Exmos believe clearly? Do they believe that Joseph practiced polygamy? Absolutely. Yeah. They believe he's a fraud. They believe that, I, I would say there are two different factions of this. So you've got the one, there's one group that believes he's a pious fraud, mm -hmm. like Dan Vogel. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. where they basically say, well, Joseph Smith um, be- had maybe had authentic experiences and he believed these authentic experiences, yeah. but it was a product of a hallucinated mind or, um, or wishful thinking. Right. And so they take a more, a kinder approach to it. And then there's the others who just, no, he was trying to have, he was trying to steal money, steal people, steal women. He's just a fraud and he's the most terrible person on this earth. Yeah. And we got to flame him because, you know, and everything that's followed right. is a result of Joseph Smith. The things that we don't like about our modern prophets is because they've got Joseph Smith's DNA in them. Well, I, I think that the TBMs and the Exmos have, they put Joseph in the same camp, really. Yes. I mean, really, they, they put, yes, they yeah. both say, yeah, he did all of, all of these yeah. horrendous things with polygamy. Yes, he did that. The TBMs are like okay with it, and yeah. the Exmos are like, how can you possibly be okay with yeah. this? And, and, then, exactly. and then there's this idea of a lot the logical fallacy that we all were taught on our missions, right? If you pray about the Book of Mormon and you know the Book of Mormon is true, then you know that Joseph Smith's a true prophet. Right. Then you know the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is a true church. Then you know that President Nelson's a true prophet. Right. Well, that's a logical fallacy. Yeah. Because it doesn't work in reverse. Right. Or no, actually, it can work in reverse. If God tells you right. Russell Nelson's a true prophet, in fact, on my mission, I used to go backwards because I'm like, well, that's a better logical train than starting over here because really you have to get people to pray about the succession moment of Brigham Young. And and when he got up to speak to the saints, did he actually transfigure into Joseph Smith and did he have the keys? We never talk about that on the mission but we teach this logical fallacy. So when people lose their testimony, they might lose their testimony in Joseph Smith, but they take the whole logical fallacy argument with them and they go frontwards and backwards. And so they'll take Joseph Smith, they'll throw out right. president Nelson, but then they'll throw out Jesus Christ and Moses and, and the Bible. Right. Okay. So to sum up all of this, cause this is a huge discussion, the difference between these three, you know, they they each have their own beliefs, but they cross over in different places. And of course, how do the remnants feel about Joseph Smith and polygamy? He didn't do it. Is there any remnants you know that think Joseph did practice polygamy? I'm like, for some reason, that seems to be one of the bigger beliefs that they have in common is that Joseph was not a polygamist. Or that he translated the Book of Mormon, but by the time he got to Nauvoo... He got off the rails. Okay, that's possible, but I don't know any remnants that believe Joseph was a polygamist. Correct. You'd have to go back east and talk to Cutlerites and Hendrickites and people right. that kind of draw their DNA all the way back to Joseph's martyrdom. Yeah. And and those people, well, they <coughs> uh, and people in the community of Christ in in their church goes all the way back right. to. Um, to Missouri. And when they started off, there was factions of them that believed Joseph Smith was a fallen prophet. Yes. So we have RFM in squarely in this Exmo camp who believes that Joseph practiced polygamy and Joseph was a horrible person that the book of Mormon is a total made up fraud saying, I don't have a dog in this fight. I don't care either way. Now, does it matter who killed Joseph Smith to the Exmos? To the TBMs, it's obvious. Can I tell you, can I, let me tell you why. Because if it's shown that John Taylor and Willard Richards killed Joseph Smith, it makes the Helen Mark Kimball argument a little more difficult to deal with. Mm-hmm. How so? Because they, because all the things that Brigham Young and John Taylor and Willard Richards did was an implementation of Joseph's perfect vision. Mm-hmm. That's how they argue their entire premise. So polygamy comes from Joseph Smith. If people who are polygamous killed Joseph Smith, it strengthens the argument that perhaps he wasn't a polygamist. Perhaps he was actually in the process, like when he talked to William Marks two weeks before his martyrdom and said, I need to purge this out of the church because it's going to undo the church that maybe they got wind of that and realized they had to do something and blood atone this man so right. that they could continue doing what they wanted to do. That's right. So we understand that the rem- we understand the TBMs why it's a threat 
to their church and their belief system, but you got to understand it is a threat to the Exmos as well. So maybe they don't all see that threat yet because, again, a bunch of people wanted to know how RFM felt about who actually killed Joseph Smith, but I think RFM gets that. He gets that it hurts his position. So I could be wrong about that, but that I think we all kind of You may want to edit this out of the, the transcript, but recognize that these individuals are making money off of their viewers and right. a lot of their viewers have very strong negative beliefs about Joseph Smith. Right. And they don't want to see him as a martyr or as a good guy in any way. Right. Yeah. I don't personally care that they get money. I know that they need to do what they do and that's how they live is off of these podcasts and people find value in it. But yeah, you could make a case there, for there, how that. I would say there's a bit of a bias there. And maybe, bias. maybe I'm, I, I think that they're fair enough that they're going to help their audience overcome some of these challenges. Right. So my, my, it might just be the bias is somewhat subconscious. Right. Last question on the chart. Where do the fundamentalists fit in on this chart? Okay. Let's I would to- say, I would say that they're right about, they're right about there. Um, I think because really the church, the LDS church it still believes that polygamy is of God and right. it's still practice. It's a spiritual practice, but they practice it spiritually in right. that. I mean, for example, if you, if you are married, a husband and a wife and the wife dies, then that husband can go and get resealed to another woman right. for time and all eternity. Now, if the husband dies And the wife, and this is right in the handbook, if the wife dies, or if the husband dies, sorry, if the husband dies, then the wife can go get remarried, but it is not for all eternity. It's It's not sealed. Yeah, it's for time. So they practice it. Spiritual. They practice it. Polygamy, spiritual polygamy. Is that the word? They practice it spiritually, but it's just, and they believe it's a true principle, but it's just on hold for right now. So that's the LDS Peter, what do the fundamentalists believe? Well, let me just add one more thing on top of that, and then I'll talk about the fundamentalists, because the LDS Church has had different sorts of positions on polygamy over the years. If you go back to the 1930s and 40s, they were trying to unwind it. They didn't like it. Heber J. Grant is on record of hating polygamy and trying to purge it out of the church. He was a reluctant polygamist and uh, was forced into it, and so he didn't wanted anymore and was trying to push it out and and ironically was trying to paint polygamy as a Brigham Young idea and it stayed mm. that way for many years. If you go back to the 90s, you have uh, President Hinckley who's also trying to shove it into the past, mm-hmm. but let's put a fine point on it. Russell M. Nelson, the prophet and president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and Dallin H. Oaks, his first counselor, have both lost their wives mm-hmm. and have remarried yeah, that's a good example. virgins. So they're following the exact course of action as laid out in Doctrine and Covenants 132. Right. And they are um, projecting a, a stronger belief in polygamy today than we probably had 20 years ago. So what's a fundamentalist? A fundamentalist <laughs> is somebody who takes their beliefs back to a certain point in time. Okay. And we've had about 100 years of fundamentalism. What most people don't know is... Yes, polygamy came into the church through a lot of shiftiness, secrecy, lies, but it also left the church in much the same way. Mm -hmm. Most people are familiar with the manifesto in 1890, Mm -hmm. but it was more of a lie. Uh, Wilford Woodruff was basically telegraphing to the federal government. We're not going to practice this anymore, but they kept doing sealing ceremonies down in Mexico. Right. And so when they were trying to seat Renator seat or trying to seat Renator Senator, Reed Senator Smith. Reed Smoot <laughs> in 1912 right. or 19, <laughs> sorry, I think it's 19 something, 1906. 1906. They're trying to seat him and they're, they've got Joseph F. Smith on the stand and they're really pushing him for it. He had to issue the second manifesto right. to say, look, we don't practice this anymore, period. Right. However, <laughs> they were still doing still it doing because it. of winking and nodding <laughs> probably right. until Heber J. Grant became president. That's my personal belief. Heber J. Grant's the first one to come along and say, look, we're going to basically go out and find anybody who's doing this 
and we're going to purge him. We're going to excommunicate him. We're going to turn him over the law. We're going to work with the, with the right. United States government to drag him off to jail. And it was at that point in time, these people separated themselves into, into a camp where they said, look, we have a revelation that said we're to carry this principle forward from um, John Taylor from 1887. Right. And so you go back to the 1887 date as where they say that Mormonism got off the rails. Now, remnant is still a fundamentalist position. Right. But it goes all the way back either to 1844 when Joseph Smith dies or I would say even farther back to 1832 when the Lord condemned the church for not right. living the fullness of the gospel. I, I personally, when I think of remnant today, think of they like Joseph, Brigham, John Taylor, and they want to be doing polygamy right now. Fundamentalists. Re- fundamentalists. The fundamentalists. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah they the think the church went off like, the rails. No with way. Woodruff. Joseph was never polygamist. Everything polygamy was never him. The fundamentalists are like, yeah, that's their big thing. That's how you get exaltation is I think by you, practicing polygamy. And they exist today. And they're within the TBMs. Yeah. There's members sitting in the pew next to you that believe that, that they should be doing polygamy right now. And they think that the current heads, it's great that they're practicing it spiritually, but they want them to bring it back right now is the way that most fundamentalists think. So they do believe Joseph is a prophet. The Book of Mormon is true. They do believe Joseph practiced polygamy and they think the LDS church is more true than the remnant thinks, but not all the way true because they're not practicing polygamy right now. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay. All right. So again, I, I think it was important to go through this background so you can understand where our FM is coming from and what his, you know, biases and what his motivations might be in his questions. So he said, one of the things he said in, in this podcast is if you're going to challenge history with a really radical subversion of history, then I'm going to require more evidence, more evidence than I presented. What's your thoughts about that? Well, I don't think that this topic has had the sort of attention it's needed for almost 200 years. Mm-hmm. We've just sort of relied upon the two eyewitness statements it's been taken at face value by really all groups, <coughs> ex-Mormons, non-Mormons, and people within the church that John Taylor and Willard Richards are um, faithful witnesses to this. Right. And they've just kind of placed it over in the corner and said, okay, let's move on and look at other other topics that are more controversial. Right. And so, I again, I don't think it's been done justice the way it needs to. Over have been time, done. they've actually, they used to really concentrate on William Daniel's testimony. And then they gave up on that in the 70s and switched to Willard Richards and John Taylor testimonies, which is crazy because they conflict all over the place. So it's a conglomeration of those two things as the standard church narrative right now. And I'm like, that's all they ever have gone off of is the two eyewitnesses. They never have looked at the physical evidence. So when RFM says you have to have, you know, this really radical idea. You have to have way more evidence. I'm like, we've got all the physical evidence now going against the narrative. That's enough for anybody should be willing to consider this. I think you've got three portions to this. I think you've got the physical evidence. You've got the historical record record. Mm -hmm. And one enormous area that we haven't talked about much is motive. And I, I, okay. So if you just take the physical evidence, I mean, even the the expert that you had on, he didn't, I mean, he just said, and we, I think we all agree that there's not enough to convict in a court of law, okay? Right. But when you take the historical record, when you take the physical evidence, and when you put motive in, right. you, it's like, you can't deny that. I don't, unless you're yeah. just, it's like looking at the... I it is interesting. There's been so many people when they watch the movie that are more in the TBM camp and they're like, this just makes no sense. There would be no reason that they would do that. Yeah, I mean, if you're watching a detective show on TV, and I think, I, I don't know if how true this is in, in real life, but they always talk about how to convict someone in a court of law. The mm-hmm. prosecutor's looking for a weapon. They're looking for a body and they're looking for motive. And they can find all three of these things. Usually they can get a jury to convict. Right. In this circumstance, we've talked about the weapons. We've talked about the bodies. Um, we haven't really talked about motive 
And um, I just lost my train of thought there. So <laughs> I'll tell you that um, with the TBMs, they can't see it. They can't see the yeah. motive. The, the remnant all see the motive immediately. Of course, who gained the most when Joseph and Hiram and the Smith family was taken out? Who gained the most by that? It's obvious. But if you talk with Exmos, again, they're not necessarily thinking that the inside job is real, but those that are considering it, how do they explain the motive? Hmm. The very few that I've talked with, they say, well, Joseph was a horrible guy, so they were trying to take him out. Oh, <laughs> like, no. It's a change in, uh. it's a change in the style of management. <laughs> right. They don't like the fact that he was... And, and honestly, I somewhat agree with that statement. I think it, if you were to go back and look at Brigham Young and when he first started to sort of like veer off of the reservation mm -hmm. of believing in Joseph Smith, it was not that I don't believe he's a true prophet. It's that I think he manages the church like crap and I right. could do a better job. Yeah. And instead of people like John Bennett and people like um, William Law right. and the Fosters and even Oliver Cadre, who got very public about their disagreements with Joseph and then they got sent off the farm. Brigham Young right. decided on a different approach, which is yeah. I'll just keep my beliefs to myself and a few small group of people. And then we'll just kind of work through it. Except for once where he's on record saying Joseph's horrible with money. Yes. Brigham was a big money man. He's like, he's like one time he was, the, there was a quote from him. He's like, haven't I made this people very profitable or something like right. that? He was a big, really yeah, my, yeah, and my favorite statement comes courtesy of Michael Quinn, who was digging through the archives. I'm still looking for a facsimile of this uh, um, conference that Brigham Young talked at. I believe it was in 1857, somewhere in Davis County. Mm -hmm. But he basically says that the last two weeks of Joseph's life, he didn't have one particle of spirit with him. And um, essentially, he lost his prophetic mantle. He was sort of implying that. Right. And um, it was clear from what is talked about in, in Quinn's book that most of the people had already heard that before. This was not a new idea, but they've tried very hard to kind of scrub that idea right. because it implies with all we know about how Mormonism believes about the infallibility of prophets. Right. If a prophet makes a mistake, what will the Lord do? The Lord will remove that remove prophet. Him, right. Well, you know, when I was young, I thought, well, that's two lightning strikes when he walks out in the street <laughs> down Salt Lake City. That's how the Lord's going to do it. Right. But as I've gotten older, I realize, no, the Lord gives his power unto men and gives his power unto the priesthood. And the priesthood can do that mm. if the priesthood needs to. Huh. And so I thought about that and I've kind of married that up with that statement from 1857. And I'm like... Well, there is a statement right there that shows that Brigham Young had motive and believed that maybe he was righteous yes. in that belief of getting Joseph and Hiram out of the way. I think they thought yes. they were doing good. I do think that. Yes. One of the questions I asked a different forensic detective in part one was how did Willard and John Taylor hold on to this lie together for 10 years? Because in every movie you've ever seen, one guy rats the other one out eventually. And the detective said, that's a really good point except in one case. And that's when religion's involved. When religion's involved, every, all the rules change. Mm. So if Brigham thinks what he did was for God and John Taylor and Willard thinks that what they're doing for God, it changes all the rules right. on motivation and why and when and how you can do things and why you can lie about it and it's all okay. And we can't overstate the fact that these people left the United States of America went out into the desert a thousand miles away and were essentially isolated for the next 40, well, the next 20 oh, years, while, essentially right. until the railroad came through. And so there's a lot of motivation to play nice and go along with the leader, because if you didn't, uh, a thousand miles back is a long way. Yeah, your not, survival was on the line. You're not going to get support. Yeah. And so, you know, there was a lot of motive to kind of toe the line. Which is that not a part of genius on Brigham's part? Get him away from everybody. And I would say that about polygamy, that if the poor women who are living polygamy under Brigham had a choice, 
if they were back east amongst other people that would be like, what are you doing? And could see they what a left. real, I think they would have left it. Yeah. But because they were isolated and could talk with nobody but him about what polygamy is, he convinced them all this is from God and they were not allowed to question that. Well, so, that Colorado City and that that's the way, Short Creek area, that's the way they do polygamy today. They isolate him. They put him right. all alone. That's right. Okay, so next question. So RFM... Um, when he would talk about Detective Steiner, kept using the term expert witness. And what an expert witness is, is somebody, when you're trying to present a case in court, you hire an expert witness that goes along with whatever your theory is that you're presenting to the jury. And I think he said that so many times. I'm like, he was very careful in choosing his terminology and continuing to use him as an expert witness. Now, at first he said, <coughs> you know, you can get a witness to say whatever you want. So he was going down that path, but then he took it back and Dr. Bell agreed with him and said, no, we think the detective is a very credible witness, expert witness. Why did they do that? Why were they setting this whole thing up? Um, well, let me ask you a question. When you, when you decided to put an expert witness on, um, well, an expert witness that they called him, were you thinking to yourself, all I got to do, all I got to do is get this one expert on. And if he says that it was an inside job, then I know that everybody in the world will believe that. No, I was not thinking that. In fact, what I was thinking was how can I get this theory out there? If this is correct, if it was an inside job, how do I get more people to consider it? Yeah. So if there is a detect, so maybe sort of yes to what you're saying, but I didn't hire the witness or I didn't hire detective Steiner with that purview whatsoever. What I said to him was, I will give you access to everything I have. Here's all the reports. Here's all the evidence. You can watch anything you want from any of these guys. And then we will get back together. And what I want you to do is comment on all four theories from part one. And then I want you to comment on the evidence. And I want you to tell me what you think happened. And I don't want to bias you any more than I already have. So don't tell me what you're going to say until we get together in that room. And I was sweating it. And the reason why I was sweating it is because he, he could have, you know, come out and said the inside job theory is completely wrong. Yeah. Now, that would have been fine because if it was wrong, I want to know that. But at the same time, I invested all my life. I got excommunicated over it. I would have to apologize. So that part would have been hard. But I definitely wanted the truth. And me and Steve talked about it. Whatever he says, we're going to put it in the film. We're putting it in there. <laughs> whatever. So then he came that day and we went through everything and that's what you saw on camera. So let me give you my experience. Um, as, as someone who watched it, wasn't really super involved with the film. The first one I watched, I thought was uh, very well done, but one of my critiques, I think I talked to you about this was, yeah. I was like, you need an expert to come in and sort of validate your theories because you were talking right. a lot about in particular ballistics. I think we talked about what happens when a bullet hits a um, a femur or a muscle tissue or right. something like that. And yes, you went out and showed it and you did some sort of empirical science, which is great. You know, everybody commends you on even RFM and Bill real commended you on, you know, doing that sort of empirical science. But I was like, it'd be nice if you had someone who does this for a living, come in and talk about that. Right. So then I go into part two and in part two, you know, you could segment what you're trying to prove in a bunch of different pots. Right. One is a, obviously you've talked about how there was a spiritual element to this movie. Um, and that's over in a separate pot. And then you have this idea that, um, the different evidence, the different theories out there don't hold water. That's another pot. Then there's the whole, like I did a bunch of forens I did a bunch of empirical science. Does that hold water? And that's another pot. And then you have this kind of ultimate conclusion of how, what, how did it all go down? Right. which is all conjecture by all by um, by all people involved, because unless you're there, you're never going to know 100% for sure. You can create a, a best guess theory, 
but you have all these different pots. When, when I listened to detective Steiner come in, he validated your, your, uh, he validated you on two of the three sort of evidence pots. One being that the other theories didn't hold water. The second on all of the ballistics forensics that you did, he agreed with all of that very, very firmly. It was just that third area where, you know, what do you think really happened? In my mind, I felt like that that's him stepping out of his expertise and providing his own like ideas on what he thought happened. I didn't necessarily place his expertise on that in, into that particular bucket. Right. He was just like everybody else trying to figure out what really happened. He's a crime scene investigator, you know, so he's yeah. just, he, he's, he's in court. And when, and when, you know, people like him, when they go into a courtroom setting, they have to be very, very factual. Right. And so all he could do, if he was to be called into a courtroom and trying to convict John Taylor and Willard Richards was talk about the nature of the, the wounds, the nature of what happened to the bodies and the fact that there had to be small caliber arms involved. Right. Then you have to leave it up to other people to yeah. prove that the small caliber arms were only in the possession of the men that were in that room. Right. That's a much more difficult hill to climb. Yeah. He had no idea about Joseph Smith by the church, anything before he started he has no idea about the motive. He he told me up front, I have nothing to do with the motive. Motive is not scientific. I just stick with the science and what this evidence says. So again, I thought RFM was setting me up by calling him an expert witness. And then he says, and the expert witness doesn't agree with him. Therefore, everything Justin has said is completely off. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of a logical fallacy in a way. Yeah, so... They all three agreed that forensic evidence trumps eyewitness accounts. Yes. Randall Bell said that. Yes. As well. But does the expert witness trump the forensic evidence? Well, I wouldn't say that they would think he was trumping the physical evidence, but they said whatever the expert says, that's who we're going to go with. But I didn't believe him. I thought if the expert had said something else, he would have said, then your expert, you just paid him off to say that. So I, I thought that was very interesting. Almost like you couldn't have won. I couldn't have won with him. Why couldn't I have? This is why. <laughs> I couldn't win. Either way I did it, he would have found that That's how I felt. I didn't feel like I was totally being attacked. I didn't feel like they were being unfair in that way, but I felt like he did have a dog in the fight yeah. and he was going to find it because there's so much I presented in the movies. And he's like, I just want to concentrate on that witness, that expert witness. And I bet yeah. you he will refute you. If you, if you were to talk to him about it, he will say, you know, that we believe in going whatever, wherever the evidence takes us and wherever the experts tell us um, okay. where we are super rational. We never have biases. Okay, so let's be really clear here. Was the detective's findings a win or a loss for the inside job theory? It was a win. It was a win. He got you 85% of the way there. Okay, what did we agree on? You agreed that, not, not that it was an inside job, but that there's no way that Joseph... You agreed on the ballistics. Yes, we agreed first and foremost that the narrative of the LDS church is wrong. That the eyewitness accounts don't work. The eyewitness yeah. accounts don't work. We fully agreed on that. You also agreed that the kind of um, the kind of injuries that Hiram uh, encountered, encounter is not the right word, but the kind of injuries that... Uh, that <laughs> <laughs> essentially the shot through the yeah. chin you agreed on that yes and we agreed and th that, that it was small caliber ballistics and small caliber arms we agreed that Hiram was not shot through the door that changes everything and we agreed that he was only shot once in the head not twice and that that shot was entered under the chin and exited out of the nose RFM didn't say any of that all he concentrated on was he didn't agree with your theory. He had a different theory. Well, you said that over, you said that you pointed that out. And then he was like, he was like, well, you're not answering the question. Okay. And then right. he rephrased that same question, but. Right. Which is interesting because later on, I think it's pretty easy to disprove the detective's theory. And so now I'm like, okay, since you put all your eggs in his theory, 
And the funny, this is the funniest part of the whole show. He relies on the expert. And then he came up with his and own. And he theory. comes up with his own different theory because he could see the expert theory yeah. didn't work. Yeah. I'm going to say that again. He relies on the expert, but after I questioned him on the expert's theory, he abandoned that and came up with his own theory. Now, what was his own theory? I'm going to play that now. You want to hear my theory? Yeah, of course. I'd love to. <laughs> There's dispute about which is the entry and which is the exit wound in spite of what the coroner said. You go along with the coroner. See, I did actually watch the movies, uh, yeah. but uh, there's some dispute about which is the exit and which is the uh, entrance wound on Hiram, because I think your whole case centers on Hiram and the in and the wounds to his body. There's a lot of other stuff that's kind of yeah, circulating perfect. out there. But as I see your theory, as you present it in your movies, it really focuses on the injuries to Hiram. So here's what I'm going to suggest. OK, yeah. this is the entry wound and I probably have it on the wrong side. It should be here. And this is the exit wound here. And the reason that, and the way it comes about is simply that Hiram is at the door with other people at a door, which is made out of wood, which apparently the latch doesn't even work. I mean, can you imagine how, oh, it just put a terrible team in the situation huh? they were in. Yeah. <laughs> well, they, they were in the nice exclusive, the jailer's bedroom. So they've got this nice wooden door that doesn't even latch or have a lock on it. But Hiram is at the door with others, but he's at the door trying to hold it closed, but he's not up against it like that. What he's doing is he's down low, his arms are extended, and his head is down, just like if you're pushing a car. His head is down, his arms are extended, and it's that angle that gets it far enough away from the door to avoid the wood damage, but allows the shot to come in through the nose and out through the underside of his chin. That's my theory for now. It's a, just a working theory I've got going. Okay. So your theory is the Lion Brothers theory. <laughs> okay <laughs> the lion brothers theory <laughs> that's awesome their name yes unfortunate so they are believe the experts people the detective says he was shot under the chin the coroner says he was shot under the chin that's the two main experts in this case and he can't let that happen that it was shot under the chin I'm like, you don't have a dog in the fight? Why aren't you like, okay, if the expert said it was under the chin, it's under the chin. Why won't he give this detail up? Well, I'm Sad telling question. you why. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, why won't he give that up? Everyone agrees it's under the chin. The historical record, under the chin. Because when he goes and speaks at Thrive in a couple of weeks, <laughs> if he admits that, he's going to have a, real, a lot of really angry people throwing tomatoes at him so he for giving you credence he doesn't want to say it came under the chin so he but he agrees that it's one shot he's convinced there's no exit wounds there's no two shots to the head so i'm like okay we agree at least on that point but you're saying that the entry is through the nose and through the chin so we have gone me and steve and shown why that can't be the case the angles don't work if he's leaning against the door then his head is not in the right direction that if it penetrates the nose and comes out of the chin, it will still strike him somewhere in the body. And he has no wound anywhere else in, in his body, up in this part of his body. Okay, so I promised RFM that I would call this the RFM theory. And we're gonna go through the RFM theory now. So according to that theory, Steve is going to pretend like he is Hiram. Steve is about, how tall are you? 5'10". So Hiram is about 5'10 to 6 foot, so he's in the range. The bullet hole through the door is 51.75 inches from the floor. So we've got that marked. And then this string is the bullet path, which we can measure. It's five degrees down. So that right there is the angle of where that bullet came through the door. Now, according to the RFM theory, Steve, if you'll push up against the door, you have, this looks like it lines up because his head gets pretty close to that angle. But here's the problem, is this shot enters the nose and exits the chin. You see that angle? No, let me, let me move my head. Just right there, yeah. 
Now, in order to match up with the angle from the door, his head's got to go down. So move your head down. Have you got the string in there, Steve? Keep going yes. down. Keep going down, and now we're about there. And here's the problem. That bullet would hit the nose, exit the chin, and strike him in the chest. So no matter what angle we do, Peter, if you can move the string down. Okay, Steve would still have to keep, now you can move your head up a little bit to try and match that angle. It's still hitting his body. And Hiram has no wounds here in the body. He has a scrape across his vest right here, but there's no wounds and that ball when it exited easily would have penetrated his body again. So now Steve, stand up. Just straight and look at the door. So again, you can see the angle of the shot. If he was just standing there, if, if a mobster came in through the door and just tried to shoot him like this, if he was standing straight up, it would hit his body. Now look back as far as you can, Steve. Okay, there you go. Now the angle works. If Steve was looking all the way back like that, and was shot through the nose and it exited out of the chin, that shot wouldn't hit his body. So how reasonable is it for him to be able to lean against the door with his head all the way back like that? Try your best, Steve. Okay, no, you've got to, you've got to match this string angle. All right, <laughs> you'd have to get fur, you'd have hey, to let get... Let me help you. All right, so you're gonna put your head all the way down. Keep looking up, no, keep looking up. <laughs> I'm gonna have to lift his body and get him parallel to the ground in order to hit that shot. This is why I know that the Lion Brothers didn't work. I tried to explain that in part one and part two, but RFM, this is why it doesn't work. The Lion Brothers say that Steve was up against the door and RFM knows that doesn't work because the detective said the stippling and the splintering would have showed up on the face mask. So RFM said his working theory is that he was, well, he was away from the door then. And that explains that part of it, but it doesn't solve the angle part of it. That's why that theory won't work. So it can't work. I already explained that from the Lion Brothers. And he's like, well, mine's different from the Lion Brothers because he's standing back from the door. He's not up at the door. I'm like, it's the same angles. Those same angles don't work. So to be, to be frank and to give him a little bit of a, uh, of a leash here, he did say that it was a working theory and maybe if he has a chance to really think about it some more, he'll right. kind of back off of it. Maybe. So that's why I'm doing this podcast to say RFM, here's why your theory doesn't work, my friend. So you got to come up with another theory. And while you're at it, he says they're pushing against the door. The detective relies on that account that they're pushing against the door. Guess what? Out of all of the accounts, there's 73 accounts that I found of people talking about the martyrdom. About 50 were people that were there, knew somebody were there, and about 20 of those were there. Out of all of those accounts, how many come from people that were actually inside the jail, besides Willard and John Taylor? Three. It's two. Two gave accounts from inside the jail. Both of them say we came up, the door was closed, we fired through it, and it flew open. Neither of them talk about this tussle back and forth on the door. So John Taylor and Willard Richards talked about that, but interestingly, they contradict each other. One says it was just two of them, just Hiram and Willard were against the door, and then John Taylor says it's all four of us. So I think that story is bogus, the whole back and forth door thing. So I'm like, right there, there's, they weren't up against the door. Dan Jones from the previous night said no one was standing against the door. They were to the sides and put a chair against the door. And that's what makes sense. And every detective movie you ever watch, you stand next to the door to buy yourself those few crucial moments. When they walk in, you can get the jump on them. They weren't standing against that door. So I'm like, okay, RFM, there's another reason historically why your, your theory can't work. And there's another reason historically why the detective... His theory can't work. Does that make sense? So Bill Real says, whatever conclusion has the most evidence and the least amount of allowances and conjecture, that's the most probable and rational conclusion. Do you agree with that as a way to narrow down? That theories? sounds reasonable. Yeah. I okay. think it's very useful when you're trying to deal with something in a legal matter 
It's not always true, right? but I think it's, it's useful to try to get to the bottom of things. So I agree with it. Whatever conclusion has the most evidence, the least amount of allowances and conjecture, that's the most probable and rational conclu- conclusion. So let's go through the five theories. The Eldridius narrative. Does it have the most evidence and least amount of allowances and conjecture? I'll help you out. It's the worst of all. <laughs> well, if you're going to, if you, if, if, if you're relying upon the eyewitness statements as being, as trumping the physical evidence, uh-huh. then, then yes. Yes. It, but we have all agreed that it's the physical evidence that trumps the eyewitness account. Right. Even RFM Bill Real said that. The physical evidence crushes the church's narrative all over the place. But the Lion Brothers theory, how does the physical evidence stack up against the Lion Brothers theory? There is no splintering on the face mask. That's huge. There is no additional wound to the chest from the angle that they're saying he was shot through the door. There's no blood on the back because they're saying he spun and was shot right after he was shot in the face. There would have been time for that to bleed and there was none. And they say when he was shot through the nose and exited the chin after that shot is when he said, I'm a dead man. Is there anyone on the planet that believes you can blow someone's tongue out and they can still say, I'm a dead man? So the Lion Brothers does not match the physical evidence at all. And RFM said that what he always believed that was a bit of a flourish on, um, on I think it was it John Taylor that said that, right? That I'm a dead man. I'm a dead man. He yeah. said that was a flourish that he Actually, never believed. Actually, it was Willard. Oh, was it Willard? Yeah, and my daughter was reading Hamilton, and Hamilton said that. I'm a dead oh, man. I'm a dead man. You know what? Which Willard. Like, that's so weird. No, it's fascinating, because Willard, he was a doctor, right? Mm-hmm. And back in those days, it, you weren't just... You were educated. There was so little knowledge really available that you, when you were a doctor, you were Mm -hmm. educated in everything. So one of the things that Willard would have been educated in is Shakespeare. Uh. Okay. And so he kind of, I mean, it's so dramatized and, you know, it's just, it's Shakespeare. Yeah. I think he was embellishing a bit for exactly. So Sam Weston, Sam Weston's theory of course is that he got shot in the back first, Hiram then fell to his knees and then was shot through the face. Why does that mat- not match up? There's no blood in that back wound. It was the first shot. It should have spewed blood all over the place. Second of all, that would require the two shots to the face and there's no exits from those. So the evidence does not match up with that theory. It doesn't match up with the Lion Brothers, doesn't match up with the church, doesn't match up with Sam Weston. Gary Smith explains he takes the Lion Brothers theory and then says the back shot came later. So he explains, according to the evidence, a really good theory, but he goes with the Lion Brothers theory and the Lion Brothers theory can't work because the one shot didn't enter here and and exit here because it didn't hit anywhere else on the body. Well, and they say that was a musket too, right? And And they they, say it was a 69 caliber musket. That's right. And we've shot, you know, one of our first test shots was through a log that we set up with a uh, cinder block behind it, it split the log in half and smashed the cinder. <laughs> so a shot coming through the, the half inch door panel that hits him here and exits here is still going to wound him. Guaranteed. And there's nothing there. And you wouldn't have a face left really. Okay. So whatever conclusion has the most evidence and least amount of allowances and conjecture, that's the most probable and rational conclusion. Every single one of those theories goes against the physical evidence. The physical evidence disproves them. The only theory that currently stands that answers all the physical evidence is the inside job theory. Well, and um, I'll back up a little bit more and just say, we know there were small caliber rounds. We know there were smart, small caliber firearms. That's what's been proven both by you and the expert that you brought in. Right. The simplest answer is the weapons that caused those murders are the yes. weapons that we have record of and yes. the only weapons we have record of in the historical <coughs> evidence in the, in the historical record are the small caliber weapons that were yeah. in that room. I think there's like one that you talked about from a mobster that maybe was carrying a, a musket rifle, but still you're still fa- you're firing a higher caliber round at that point. So yeah, John Taylor said that they had rifles and muskets. But neither he or Willard ever said pistols. The only pistols that are mentioned in their accounts were Joseph and Hiram. There you go. So that's the simplest right. explanation to me is that 
the firearms that were in the room or the ones that caused the murders. Right. And uh, that points more closely towards an inside job than any other theory. So I've had enough experience with people who do not want to believe the inside. They are motivated to find a reason to shoot the inside job theory down. I've had enough experience with them that I can Fun intended. Yeah. <laughs> no, it wasn't, but it's pretty good. <laughs> um, I have enough experience with what the reactions are. And their first is they always say, well, of course the eyewitnesses get it wrong. They, you know, memory, it was a stressful moment. And I'm like, good. I'm glad we agree. The eyewitness <laughs> accounts don't work. And then they're like, crap, I fell into that trap. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm not trying to trap you. We agree. The eyewitness account can't work. There's only one guy I've ever talked with. That's Taylor Smith that says, no, I agree that the eyewitness accounts are how it happened. I'm like, how's that even possible, man? And he did not <laughs> want to give on that point, which, because anyway, next, but these guys all admitted that the forensic evidence trumps the eyewitness accounts and the eyewitness account can't work. That still goes along with their narrative. Yeah, the LDS church is lying. We agree with that. Are they lying about polygamy? No, not polygamy, but they're, they, were, they were lying about Carthage. Joseph okay, Smith good. was a product of the 19th century, <laughs> except for polygamy. He except invented that. Except for polygamy, <laughs> yeah. That he invented. The church has yeah. never been honest about anything. It's all lies, except for polygamy. That's the one thing they're being honest on. And so they join up with the LDS church to tell the world Joseph Smith was a polygamist. Yeah, they're good buddies. Next, the next main skeptical reaction of someone who does not want, who wants to fight against the inside job. They say it is impossible to know what happened that long ago. What do you say to someone that says that? It's impossible to know what really happened. You say, then why are we even doing any of this? I mean, why look at anything? Why, why study the Civil War? Why study... Yeah. history in any why are we reading the book of mormon why anything yeah if you can't know anything yeah. why try yeah i mean history is more of an art than a science and particularly with mormon history it's all about usually about what people have written down in journals what they state they heard joseph smith say um there's some court records out there that are a little bit stronger but rarely do you have an argument or discussion that really revolves around physical or forensic evidence. Right. And this is where this is really different. And it creates sort of, I think there's a bit of a zeitgeist, I think that you created with this movie that I think is going to go away um, very soon. Use but, big words, Peter. <clears throat> Tell me what zeitgeist, zeitgeist? means. Zeitgeist? <laughs> it's the spirit of the moment, the spirit of the age. Oh, it's, okay. it's uh, um, but, <clears throat> but, and I agree, you can't know 100% for certain, unless you can go back in time in a time machine and look, right? but you can approximate and you can, um, I mean, we know, for example, that someone didn't walk through a wall, you know, and shoot them and then walk out of a wall. Cause right. that's against the law of physics, right? You have four walls in there. You got four right. men in there. You have mobsters outside. There's only a few different scenarios that could work. And so you have to kind of run through all of those. You have physical evidence. You have some eyewitness testimony. You put it all together into a soup and you can approximate or come up with a narrative that best answers the, the, the question of the day. Right. And I think as long as you say, look, we're doing our best and this is probably the most possible answer. Yeah. I think you're standing on pretty good ground. Yeah. What I always say to them, if it's impossible to know what happened, how do you know the mob did it? It's a good question. And their answer is, well, the overwhelming historical account. <laughs> because they admitted it. Because they hated Joseph Histor Smith. A historical account is the most contradictory thing of all time. Right. You don't have to look at that very long to realize that's not the way to know that that happened. And then here's the physical evidence that all refutes the way that right. that happened. Because a lot of them shot him on the ground outside at the well and they admitted it. And so they're like, oh, case closed. And yeah. you're like, but that doesn't answer how he got out the window yeah. and on the ground. By they never say... It's impossible to know. Therefore, I don't know if the mob did it or if it wasn't inside. They always say, it's impossible to know. Therefore, the mob did it. <laughs> anyway, um, next. So when you worked through those two reactions and they realized the illogical stance, then they come to the three. Well, I call it the magic bullet miracle alien theory. And this is where they're like, 
Okay. It's like John F. Kennedy, right? Lee Harvey Oswald, the magic bullet. Yeah, I can't explain yeah. it, but I need to defend this. And Well, that bullet from the Lions brothers, the angle doesn't matter because it could have hit and bounced off something and then came out of the chin yeah. and shot forward instead of into his body. And so that sounds like a lot of conjecture there. Yes. Dustin. It is conjecture. <laughs> it's exactly right. And I'm like, okay, it bugs the heck out of me when people say there are a million possible theories. I'm like, name one. <laughs> tell me one. Well, and, and you can't tell me one that doesn't fit the evidence because we have all these specific pieces of evidence that you have to cover and incorporate into your theory. Name one that can in cover all of those. And they're like, well, an alien could do it. This is another Taylor <laughs> to make some point. He's like, well, an alien could come in and with his spaceship and he miss. And I'm like, okay, I'll qualify that. Name one that is actually believable <laughs> that people would actually be convinced of. And there's not. None of those other theories fit all of the evidence. That's the bottom line. There's only one. The inside job fits it. And you're like, well, you had to twist everything around. And I'm like, no, it's actually even believable. It's of, of the four or five that are believable, only one actually covers all the evidence and explains all of the evidence. Only one. That's the inside job theory. Okay. Let's see. RFM, like the last thing he wanted to do when I was, when I was going to call in is he asked one question and he said, I want you to answer this. And he, he restated it in a couple of different ways, but he was basically like, why are you so sure that it was an inside job? And the detective didn't agree with you. Why are you still so sure? Why aren't you just accepting the expert in this case? How will both of you answer that? Well, first of all, let me ask you this. Do you think it was an inside job? Absolutely. Most likely. Why? When the when Detective Steiner came up with a theory that was not an inside job theory, why are you sticking with that? That's what the experts said. Because when I watched the film, I saw that his expertise ended when when he stopped talking about ballistics and firearms. When he started talking about what do you think happened in that room and he's got to develop a story and a theory, he's just like the rest of us trying to piece it all together. Right. He's no different than you, no different than me. He's just trying to figure out what he thinks might have happened. And I'm thinking like he would be thinking as a detective sitting on the stand going, geez, what I could say may end up convicting somebody in a court of law. So I need to come up with another scenario that is possible that... Um, that I can explain so that, you know, we can make sure that we cover all of our bases here. Right. And cause I don't want to put somebody in jail if they're not really guilty. Right. And so that's the way it came off to me is that he was trying to find other ways to explain right. what could have happened. Not that this was the, this is my expert witness telling you yeah. this is what actually happened. Yes. He said there could be many other theories but he only named one and that theory was fairly easy to shoot holes in. So that was interesting. I would like to say, can you name any other ones? But I gave him kudos because I'm like, I didn't know when he first, you know, explained it. I had to test it first. And now that I've gone through that testing, you know, process, I can say, no, it didn't work. So name another one. So the only other scenario that I come up with in my head is mobsters storming the room Mm -hmm. and executing Hiram Smith, just like the forensic and ballistic evidence says it does. Mm -hmm. But then the story is so radically different than what Rillard Richards and John Taylor said. And the two witnesses. And the two the witnesses. Mob, none of them say anything. That like they say they never even went into the room. There you go. So it would, it would invalidate all of those historical accounts. Yeah. And, and so you're going... Well, the only motivation for that would be um, maybe they were being cowards and they were hiding in the corner right. and ran when they came in the room and basically right. pointed right. at the Smith brothers and said, get them, get them, you know, not get us here. Our hands are up. 
And, but then after the fact, they wanted to create this like story of being heroes. Either way, that doesn't look good for them either. They may not be murderers, but then they're almost worse. They're cowards. So I don't know. That's the only other theory I can come up with that might be possible that fits the forensic evidence. We're going to test that theory. It's a good one. (laughs) So, I mean, the detective Steiner, he said he came up with his own theory and I agree with Peter. I, he, he's just giving his own theory. If he were on a witness stand, nobody's asking him what he thinks happened. Okay. That's, that's inadmissible in court. So he says you could have me and you and two, three, four, five other people give their theory of what they think happened that fits the evidence. But didn't in the first one, didn't you in the credits, didn't you have like a detective say, I think it was an inside job. I did. Yep. Yeah. It was a different yeah. one. Yep. I remember that. She didn't have near the experience. Um, she had about 200 homicides that she had investigated. Detective Steiner was over 2000. Mm. So yeah, it just wow. added a whole lot different level of weight to it. So cool. So I didn't, I, when he asked me that I wasn't clear. And so I want to be clear now. Why do I still think it was an inside job? Even though detective Stein came up with a different theory. First of all, it is the only theory that accounts for all of the evidence. Detective Stein's first shot, he says, comes through the back. There's no blood in that shot. I'm like, bam, right off the bat. That's a big no. That's what kicks Sam Weston's theory out is there's no blood in the back. So if you're going to say that as a theory, you're going to have to explain why. And he didn't explain why on that. There's only one theory that accounts for all of the evidence. That's the inside job theory. So all of them, all of them that, and I'll add to it that are believable. Yeah. Magic bully, magic bullet, alien theory can explain all the evidence, but it's not believable. So that's actually believable is the inside job. All the other theories have been eliminated. And at the core of the theory is this, however, this shot was made, because we know this shot was made, Willard and John had to have lied about it. Why? Why would they lie about that? Why would they not, you know, come up with something sort of close to that? Why would they spin this yarn that is completely different? Well, that's coming up in part three. Yeah, in part <laughs> three, exactly. And then last but not least, all of John Taylor's wounds were small caliber. All they mentioned was rifles and muskets. And other people said 35 gunshots of muskets and rifles. And yet somehow all the wounds that end up in John Taylor, all four are small caliber. And all four of those happen to match up with Joseph had three shots and Iram had one shot. He gets shot four times. They had four shots to give all small caliber. So going back to Bill Real's statement about the most rational explanation with the least amount of conjecture seems to fit better with the inside job theory than anything yes, else. Absolutely. Based upon ballistics, based upon the forensics. Yes. And even, which they didn't talk about at all in part two now, even the historical, because I knew the weakness of the inside job was John Taylor and Willard Richards having guns. And then the historical account came out and showed evidence. They all had guns. Why would they leave that out of their eyewitness account? Interesting. The, the historical account, oh man, there's all sorts of evidence that shows it could have been an inside job. But the forensic evidence is where I still say, this is why I believe this. Now, let me ask you the last question. Why is it important to figure this out? Is this just another true detective crime scene TV show or... And before, before you answer that, I'm going to qualify it again. I know we're biased. We're part of the remnant. We believe Joseph was a prophet, didn't practice polygamy. Book one is true. We don't believe Brigham and on were true prophets. I can see that bias in there and everything that we say. So I'm admitting that up front. But I'm going to ask you guys again. You personally, why is it so important that we figure this out? 
Um, well, I think that this particular story may be the most, uh, maybe the quickest way or the, not the quickest way. This story creates a simple way to show something disruptive in Mormonism that most people haven't thought about. And what I mean by disruptive is that we've all sort of grown up with this like idea in our head, how Mormonism played out. Most people from Exmos to remnant to um, TBMs all sort of see it sort of the same way when it comes to the relationship between Joseph Smith and Brigham Young. And I'm not talking about those people back East. They have a little bit of a different take on it, but if you can show something with lots of evidence that's disruptive to that narrative. It just gets people thinking a little bit differently. Yeah. And if you're a person of faith and you believe in God and you believe in the book of Mormon and you believe in Joseph Smith, and those are all the things that you prayed about when you were young, maybe you're on a mission or, or you're praying to go on a mission and know if those things were true, you have to consider something else now. And it may help you to just sort of think about things just a little bit differently yeah. I recognized when I was a missionary that I thought it was very strange that there were no sections of scripture from other prophets after Joseph Smith. Yeah. I never could reconcile that. It became a shelf item to me. Yeah. And so learning about something like this gives me an avenue to explore. It doesn't mean that it's true, but it means that I can take that I can go into the Lord. I can go to the Lord. I can go into my wilderness as you showcased in your movie there. Yeah. And I can try to figure out for myself what steps I need to take with the new evidence that I've learned and the new revelation that I've gleaned from the Lord. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. So why is it important that we figure this out? Well, I go back, I go back to a time when, even when, when you and I, Matt, do you remember, do you remember that? Do you remember meeting? Like online? Or online. Yeah. 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 So you and I, we were both in a Facebook group, mm -hmm. right? And I remember talking, I remember talking to you and I had some, I mean, we were both like, dude, what is going on in the church? Yeah. yeah. And so like, what is, what, why is this is so weird? Like all this stuff, like we just both start, we were reading the book of Mormon. I think you were reading, you read Mormon eight, right? Like that was a big thing for yeah. you. And for me, like the gift of the Holy ghost, baptism of fire, gift of the Holy ghost. I had read that in the book of Mormon, like Lehi, like his ex in the first six verses in the book of Mormon, you've got freak, you've got a pillar of fire right. coming down on top of Lehi. And I'm like, when you really think about that, you're like, why would that be in the first six verses of the book of Mormon? Why is that there? Okay. And why are we not, if it's there and it's important, then why are we not talking about any of that today? Yeah. Like, why is that not a topic of conversation at all? All you hear today is you got to go to the temple. You got to get your endowments out. You got to get married in the temple. Well, why in the world is none of that in the book? Of, why is marriage not even mentioned in the Book of Mormon? If the Book of Mormon is the fullness of the gospel, why? Why? And I remember meeting you and we were both just talking like, well, I don't understand what's going on. Okay. Yeah. And when you have those questions and you start investigating, you've got to have a starting point. Okay. Well, that starting point is Joseph Smith. Okay. What happened? What happened there? And where, if we've got this church now that, well, now we've got 70 different churches that all use the Book of Mormon and say different right. things. When did that start? Okay. And when did it go off the rails? And how did it go off the rails? If the Book of Mormon's true, then the LDS church cannot be true. They cannot coexist. And if the LDS church is true, then the Book of Mormon isn't true. Okay, so if we want to get back to Christ, if we want to get back to God, then we have to figure it out. Yeah, I see it as red pill, blue pill. Yeah. Do you want the truth or do you want your comfortable life? Yeah. If you want the truth, the last place you can go is to your leaders. You're going to have to figure it out on your own. Yeah. And that's not a bad thing because that should drive you to your knees. 
seeking counsel from the Lord. And if you can discover truth with his help, you'll be set in your life. You'll be fine. Don't rely on a leader for that. He's not going to tell you the truth the way that the Lord will. So it's important to get this story out there because it was an inside job. And if it was an inside job, that is proof you can't just trust your leaders to tell you what happened. They X'd me because they didn't want me talking about this. That is not the source to go to for truth. The source is God. And it's you have to do the work. So I hope, you know, the things that we're talking about, if there's a TBM that's watching this, I hope they are a little bit rattled. Not because I want them to feel like crap, because we all had to feel like crap when we started learning this stuff too. It's not fun. But because I want them to start that journey. Start that journey. Thanks, guys. Anything else you want to add? It's been fun. Yeah, Good conversation. It was. Appreciate Next time, let's talk about JFK and Daily Plaza. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. Thank you, everybody, for joining us on the podcast today. We'll see you next time.